Hello, welcome back class. So this week we are looking at race and ethnicity. We are in chapter 11, still in unit 3 for now. So let's get started. So first off, you know, what is race? It's a, you know, commonly a superficial uh, physical difference that society considers significant. Um, so we often in the social sciences, we call race a social construction. You know, it's something that, again, you know, society defines and considers significant for whatever reason. And different societies, you know, define race differently and view race differently. Um, so we call race you know, a social construct or a social construction. So race, what does that mean? It means, you know, biologically, when they, when, you know, biologists sit around and analyze our DNA um, and our blood, right, there's no real biologically identifiable trait called race. Um, you know, I mean, it really just refers to the darkness or the fairness of your skin. And that really comes down to our evolutionary adaptations to different um, you know, habitats around the world over long spans of time. So, you know, racial categories in different societies are different, look different than what we are used to. Um, and even throughout time in the United States, the way that we've defined race and racial categories has changed and transformed. Um, so we'll look at some of those different you know, racial categories on the next slides. Um, so over time, you know, certain systems of labeling, certain you know, um, terms that have been used have kind of fallen in and out of fashion when it comes to you know, kind of labeling people with certain racial categories. So, you know, essentially, you know, oftentimes when we think about race, sometimes people will say, oh, it's the amount of melanin in your skin. But sometimes, you know, how we define ourselves and our racial category, you know, goes even further than that. Um, you know, some people who call themselves, you know, quote unquote white might have more melanin in their skin than somebody who calls themselves, you know, quote unquote black. So racial categories, you know, they change with the times. Back in, you know, the 1800s, there were kind of three um, dominant racial categories that were used. The Caucasoid race, the Mongoloid race, and the Negroid race. And so the term that was used for, you know, for white people generally was Caucasoid, for you know, East Asian or Asian people was mongoloid, and then Negroid referred to you know, black people. Um, and by the 1900s, terms started changing again. Um, by then, you know, those terms had kind of fallen out of fashion. And then we had terms um, like uh, Negro or colored um, that was much more, you know, commonly used to refer to black people in the United States. Then, you know, that that system of labeling lasted well through, you know, a lot of the 1900s until the 1980s when you may have heard of um, Reverend Jesse Jackson, but he actually proposed the term African American to be kind of the new label for black people in the United States. And he said, his quote, to be called African American has cultural integrity. It puts us in our proper historical context. So he preferred that because other, you know, previous, um, you know, terms like Negro or colored, right, puts a lot of emphasis just on skin color and nothing else. Whereas he said, you know, this term African American puts more emphasis on you know, that shared history, the shared ethnicity of black Americans. So in 2000 um, was actually the first year that the term African American was put on the U.S. Census. Um, so I know to a lot of us, it seems like that term's been around forever. But, you know, it's only 
you know, a pretty new term in our system of racial labeling. Um, really first introduced in the 80s and only really institutionalized in the year 2000. Today, you know, if any of you completed the census um, in 2020, you know, the census now has either Black or African American as its, you know, racial label. A little bit more on race as a social construct and this term, you know, African American in particular. So even that term has, you know, been criticized for <coughs> a number of different reasons. First of all, you know, um, sometimes that term might include people that you wouldn't necessarily think should be in, included in that label. And sometimes it excludes people who might, you know, might fit within the, the sentiment of that racial label. So for instance, you know, Charlize Theron is, was born in South Africa. She became a U.S. citizen. You know, when we think of an African-American, is somebody like Charlize Theron, you know, is that what we're thinking of? Um, you know, when we talk about that term, for most of us, probably not, right? Um, furthermore, you know, there are many Black Americans um, also who uh, maybe, you know, came to the U.S. Um, via a different route than slavery. However, they still, you know, suffer, may, perhaps, you know, or are subject to a lot of the same kind of stereotypes and prejudices um, and racism in general, um, whether or not they came, you know, to the U.S. Um, during slavery in their family um, or not. And furthermore, another critique is that, you know, and this goes for all the, a lot of the labels we're going to talk about today that are commonly used in the U.S. today, like African American, Arab American, Asian American, Hispanic American, right? When, um, you know, Caucasian or white people you know, are, are talked about, there usually isn't like this disclaimer needed to say a white American, right? You say white people. Um, however, right, for other racial categories in our country, there always seems like there has to be this disclaimer after the ethnic or racial um, category. So that is another, you know, kind of form of, of, um, of critique against, you know, this label African American. But however we feel about it, you know, these seem to be kind of the most common, this seems to be like the most common term um, that's used uh, today, African American or um, you know, Black Americans or Black people in the United States. All right, now next several slides are going to go through um, some some vocab for us. So talk about race, um, superficial physical characteristics that society considers significant. Our next term here is ethnicity, which a racial and ethnic category can be aligned, but sometimes they're a little different. Ethnicity refers to a shared culture, so not necessarily how society is defining a certain racial category. But ethnicity has to do with, you know, a, a subgroup, a subculture, or a culture that is shared by a group of people. Um, so, you know, practices, beliefs, values, um, you know, religion, um, food, dance, traditions, holidays, art, language, all of those things can define an ethnic group. Like race, you know, ethnicity and how we've thought about it changes over time as well. So for example, and we'll get to this toward the end of this lecture, um, but you know, today we talk about you know, white Americans, white people, right? This category, um, which people from all sorts of different historical backgrounds kind of fit within this category today. However, over time, you know, some of these quote unquote white people um, that have come to the U.S. have not been accepted as quote-unquote white when they first arrived here or when their families did. 
So people, peoples like the Irish, like the Italians, Russians, Jews, Serbian immigrants, when they first arrived in the US, you know, they were not viewed as fully, you know, quote unquote, white. Um, so we'll come back to that toward the end and how they eventually you know, became incorporated within that larger label of whiteness. And then, you know, think of like the ethnic group of being British, right? Um, that comes with, the, with its own traditions and rituals and food and, um, you know, practices, values of, you know, the royalty and whatnot. Um, however, there's a whole bunch of racial backgrounds in, in England. Um, you know, there are black British people, there are white British people, Asian, Arab, and they all consider themselves British. So, you know, different racial categories can also fit within a larger kind of ethnic group. Now, here's another vocab word for you to talk about or hear about a lot um, is this term minority groups or minorities. So this refers to any group of people who, because of their physical or cultural characteristics, so because of their race or ethnicity, they're singled out from the rest of society for differential and unequal treatment. And therefore, you know, these these minority groups eventually come to regard themselves as objects of collective discrimination. So sometimes minority groups are referred to as you know, subordinate groups, or less powerful groups, while the majority groups are considered to be the dominant groups. Um, and when we use those terms, we're referring to you know, the degree of social power that they have. So importantly, you know, a minority group, this term doesn't necessarily mean that the group is a numerical minority. All right, so, you know, very large groups can be called minority groups. You may have heard some stories recently that, you know, a lot of the quote unquote minority groups in our country in not too long, probably about 10 years, maybe 15 years from now, um, you know, white, quote unquote, white people in the U.S. are going to be a numerical minority, um, you know, because the populations of um, particularly Hispanic Americans are growing so quickly and Asian Americans. Um, so, so when we talk about minority groups, usually has more to do with social power uh, and the degree of social power over you know, economics, politics, education, the media, all that, um, not necessarily referring to, you know, whether it's a small numerical group or a big one. So for instance, a really, you know, big example to illustrate that is, <clears throat> you may have heard of like apartheid South Africa, um, which lasted well past our Jim Crow era. Um, but in apartheid South Africa, you know, black South Africans, the Afrikaners made up the majority of the population in South Africa. However, there were these entrenched institutionalized systems um, of racism, of prejudice, of discrimination that was um, you know, ordained or sanctioned by you know, the leading um, political groups in the country, which happen to be, you know, of white people. Um, so even though the majority numerically were black people in South Africa, you know, white South Africans happen to hold all of kind of the, the social, political, economic power and disenfranchised um, and discriminated against, you know, black South Africans um, for far too long. So, in a nutshell, right, minority groups, that term really means and refers to a lack of power. So here's some five easy characteristics for you to think about for minority groups. Number one, 
You know, there's going to be unequal treatment, less power over their lives. Distinguishing cultural or physical traits, number two, such as, you know, again, a racial category or ethnic category, <clears throat> you know, a shared language, the clothing that they wear, their skin color. Uh, number three, involuntary membership. So, you know, people are born into that group. Um, they didn't necessarily have a choice. Um, awareness of subordination, number four. At a certain point in their life, they realize that they're not, <clears throat> they don't seem to be on equal ground with other people um, around them in society, other groups of people. And number five, a high rate of in-group marriage, meaning, <clears throat> you know, you marry people within the same, you know, quote-unquote minority group as you. Now, minority groups historically have often been scapegoated. Um, so scapegoat theory essentially um, means that, you know, when something is happening in society, something really dramatic, bad, often an economic downturn, um, you know, times when there's, you know, a major depression or recession or even war um, or other kind of conflicts, Usually the dominant group, the, the group with more social power, will kind of displace its unfocused aggression or anger about that event. Um, you know, say it's an economic you know, recession. And they'll kind of you know, put all the blame for that event onto a particular group, a minority group often. <clears throat> so scapegoating often you know, happens when resources are scarce, when economic problems are rampant. And they, you know, the scapegoated group, the minority group, gets all the blame, you know, for everything that that society is, is facing. Um, it's a very easy way, you know, to explain a lot of social problems. It's just blaming you know, one entire group of people. So a very prime example of that would be, you know, in World War <clears throat> After World War I, you know, Germany faced a lot of debts um, globally because they were kind of blamed for starting World War I. And that put Germany into a great deal of debt and economic turmoil. Um, <clears throat> and so a lot of people, you know, kind of point to that as the reason why you know, eventually the Nazi party was able to rise up because due to scapegoat theory, you know, they kind of came up with this easy solution, this easy answer. Like, oh, the reason why we are suffering so much in Germany um, and facing all this economic and political turmoil is because of, you know, the Jewish people that live um, in Germany and around the world. And so if they just, you know, <clears throat> could um, get rid of you know, Jewish people in Germany and then further beyond Germany eventually, um, everything would be fine again. So, you know, Jewish people were particularly you know, scapegoated after World War I and obviously you know, led to uh, much of the conflict in World War II. Now, some more uh, definitions here for you. So we often hear these words, you know, stereotypes, prejudices, discrimination, um, all over the media, right, <clears throat> and social media. And oftentimes they're used interchangeably. But each of these terms kind of has a little bit of a different meaning, and they kind of build on each other. So we'll go through these three. So stereotypes first. Um, they are, you know, kind of oversimplified generalizations about certain groups of people that don't really, you know, take an individual into account. So there's stereotypes, sure, about race and ethnicity, but there's also stereotypes about, you know, gender and sexuality and age and religion. Um, almost any characteristic, right, we can stereotype people based on their group membership. And sometimes um, stereotypes don't always have to be, you know, evil or nefarious. 
Um, you know, they can be positive, like women are great at multitasking or Asian people are in very intelligent and great at math, right? They, positive stereotypes are certainly, um, you know, just as possible as negative ones. However, you know, if you have negative stereotypes and you, <clears throat> um, you know, kind of feed them um, too much and they grow, this can lead to what we call prejudice. So prejudice refers to you know, your beliefs, your feelings, your thoughts, your attitudes about a certain group of people. And again, this can be, you know, prejudice against a certain race or ethnicity or prejudice against somebody of a certain age or gender or sexuality, etc. Um, importantly, you know, prejudice is not rooted in personal experience, but like the word, um, you know, like the first six letters here tell us, it is a prejudgment. You have already kind of made a judgment about a person before you even get to know them based on whatever your first you know, impression of them is. <clears throat> so you've got stereotypes, prejudice, which, you know, again, refers to beliefs, feelings, thoughts, and attitudes. So prejudice happens kind of within our brains, in our minds. This is how we're like thinking, feeling about a certain person based on our you know, prejudgments about a certain group. Um, so there's this famous experiment that was done on um, you know, our prejudices in the US, particularly in the 60s. Um, and this elementary school teacher, this little old lady right here named Jane Elliott, back in 1968, she came up with what she called the brown eye, blue eye experiment. And what she did, she was teaching, I believe it was a third grade classroom. And it was shortly after Martin Luther King Jr. had been assassinated. And she was very concerned because, you know, things in the country seemed to be getting better. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. was this great leader. Um, things were changing. Laws were being passed. You know, the Civil Rights Act, the Voting Rights Act. And then all of a sudden, this great leader of this movement you know, was assassinated. Um, and she was, you know, very concerned about just kind of this continuous racism that was happening. And also, you know, what she was kind of seeing and hearing even from her young class, um, her students and her young classes. So she developed this experiment to kind of you know, illustrate the power of prejudice to her students. So she basically the kids came in one day and she said, all right, I'm going to divide you all up. Um, those of you with brown eyes, you know, sit over here. Those of you with blue eyes sit over there. And she said, all right, people with brown eyes are so much better than people with blue eyes. People with brown eyes are smarter. They're funnier, they're more attractive. Um, you know, they're better in every single way than people with blue eyes. And she just reiterated that all throughout the whole school day, how much better kids with brown eyes were. And then she even had the brown eyed students like put these construction paper armbands on the blue eyed students to like, you know, signify their difference, their inferiority. And, you know, again, kind of continuously repeated that lesson to these kids all day. And so, um, you know, throughout the day, the kids started to, um, you know, kind of believe her. You know, the brown eyed kids started thinking that they were better than the other kids in the class simply because of the color of their eyes. And the blue eyed students started to feel, you know, sad and inferior and questioning why like something as little as their eye color, you know, would define them like this. So definitively, you know, um, but it was to establish to show to illustrate that when an authority figure like your third grade teacher, um, you know, kind of establishes a certain 
value system, right? Where certain people are valued more than others. And then they reinforce that lesson continuously. You know, it can quickly create kind of a rift between people. In this case, a rift between students with brown eyes and blue eyes. But, you know, she wanted to illustrate that that's kind of what happens in our society, too, is we're taught from very young ages, you know, we're taught all sorts of lessons implicitly and explicitly about, you know, race and racial categories and ethnicity and <clears throat> where we as whatever color, whatever race, whatever ethnicity we are, you know, where we somehow um, are positioned within this you know, value system that society has set forth for us um, and how those lessons, you know, kind of, we end up carrying them out ourselves eventually once we've internalized them. So throughout that school day, you know, and it got worse throughout the day, the brown eyed kids were like very mean to the blue eyed kids. They insulted them. They told them they were stupid. Um, you know, they were discriminated against and um, it's a very, very powerful experiment. Um, so I hope that you will go to Blackboard, you know, maybe after this little video lecture. I have some original footage of Jane Elliott's brown eye, blue eye experiment in her classroom um, that you can find on there. And it's pretty jolting to watch like these young kids, um, you know, almost like their whole worldview kind of be transformed within one single school day. And also shows you, you know, the power, especially when you're like, when you're very young and still being socialized, um, you know, to, to society's, you know, norms and values, um, how powerful the lessons we're taught at a young age can, um, you know, affect the way that we think and act. All right, one more thing on prejudice here. Well, after you watch that video, um, go ahead and this link is also found within Chapter 11 on Blackboard. Um, but it comes from the Harvard University has a um, organization called the Implicit Project. And they've developed all sorts of different tests for implicit biases. Um, but in particular, I want you all to click in there and look for the one that's called the race. IAT, and that stands for Implicit Association Test. Um, it only takes about 10 minutes to do it, um, and the instructions are really, you know, detailed and clear. So just click through that. It's a, a kind of surprising um, little exercise that they've put together uh, where you, well, it kind of tests your, your biases when it comes to race, your implicit biases even. Meaning, um, you know, maybe you're not even consciously aware of them. Hmm. All right. So that's prejudice. So we did stereotypes, prejudice. And if prejudice, you know, your feelings, your thoughts, the things that are going on in your head, if that becomes so strong in you and in society, it can, you know, that kind of biased way of thinking can lead to discrimination, which refers to actions against a group of people. So prejudice is about our thoughts and feelings, things that are going on in our head, our interpretations. Discrimination is when we act on those um, prejudicial feelings or thoughts. So discrimination based on race and ethnicity can take any number of forms, and we've seen a lot of them in our country. Um, but things like unfair housing practices, which we talked about a couple weeks ago, um, biased hiring systems, which I'll get to later on in this lecture, um, to even you know discriminatory legislation that the government you know condones and enforces, like we had with Jim Crow laws um, throughout the country and you know, separate but equal doctrines. So discrimination, importantly, you know, it doesn't just disappear overnight. You know, if a law is enacted to abolish discrimination, 
that doesn't mean, you know, everyone wakes up the next day and says, oh, you know, we're all happy and one big happy family now. Forget all that discrimination stuff we were doing yesterday. Um, you know, and we'll get to some terms later on in this chapter that come back to this thought. But, you know, discrimination takes time, takes sometimes generations to, um, you know, really um, heal from. So they're pretty, you know, complex social ills um, that permeate all sorts of different, you know, institutions in our society. And one more kind of a, a further um, or a stronger type of discrimination is racism. So a strong prejudice um, that's used to justify the belief that one racial category is superior or inferior to other ones. And then institutional racism um, kind of goes a little bit broader. You know, this is racism that is embedded in the fabric and institutions of a society. So obviously, you know, slavery throughout the South in the United States was a form of institutional racism. People of a certain race, it was okay to, you know, buy and sell and own as quote unquote property. Um, we also had the Japanese relocation and internment camps during World War II, which we'll get to a little later. Um, you had Native American boarding schools where they sent, you know, um, Native children away from their families, uh, which we'll get to later as well. We still today um, have racial profiling by law enforcement. So institutional racism is when, you know, our major institutions of society are carrying out and practicing, um, again, forms of a prejudice and discrimination that um, deliberately target people of a certain you know, racial category or label. Now, colorism um, is kind of another form of racism um, within a race. So colorism refers to the belief that one type of skin tone is superior or inferior to another within a racial group. So essentially, <clears throat> you know, I know um, in India, for instance, um, it's the skin bleaching industry is huge in India. They make billion, millions, maybe even billions by now of dollars, um, you know, selling these bleaching creams for women. Because even within, you know, this ethnic or racial group of being, you know, Indian um, or East Asian, there's still kind of like this spectrum of skin tones, and the lighter skin tones are viewed as superior, whereas darker skin tones are interpreted as inferior culturally. So that is colorism within a racial group, still kind of this, you know, spectrum of skin tones that is assigned a certain um, preference. And then institutional discrimination, um, be an I right there, refers to when a societal system has developed within an embedded disenfranchisement of a group. So when society you know, almost is defined by kind of disenfranchising, disempowering a certain group of people. Again, Jim Crow laws, separate but equal. Um, U.S. laws concerning Native Americans, which we'll get to in a little bit. Um, even the U.S. military's don't ask, don't tell policy, which has been repealed now um, throughout the 90s and early 2000s, I believe. Now, a big example of institutional discrimination went over this um, in chapter nine, so I won't spend too long on it. But one example would be, you know, that practice of redlining that I mentioned in that chapter, um, which occurred, well, for a very long time and still um, kind of occurs today. It's not as mm, not as blatant anymore. 
Um, but redlining, remember, I showed you all, I had some maps um, that showed redline districts. And that's when banks and lenders um, throughout like the 1900s would kind of systematically color in, you know, black and Hispanic neighborhoods on like maps of certain cities in red. That's why it was called redlining. And then, you know, these banks and lenders would refuse um, basically to service anyone who lived within that red territory. So it was kind of institutionally within, you know, banking and um, insurance and home ownership, kind of disenfranchising, you know, black and Hispanic people from being able to own a home um, because of these redlined maps. Now, institutional discrimination can also involve the kind of on the opposite side, the promotion <clears throat> of, sorry, of another group's status. So you may have heard, you know, this term white privilege before. Um, so <clears throat> it's kind of, you know, self-explanatory in the label there. But, you know, white privilege refers to the fact that, you know, white people, dominant um, groups in terms of social power um, often kind of assume that their own experience is the norm um, or the superior experience, human experience, and that anyone else's experience, you know, of any other racial or ethnic group or, um, you know, we'll stick with those this week, um, is kind of denied, you know, as, you know, inconsequential um you know well that's not what i experienced so and my experience is the the norm so whatever you experience is you know meaningless right so that's kind of the um the message of white privilege and i have a little um there's an additional reading link for chapter 11. Um, if you click in there there's a piece called the Invisible Knapsack um, by Peggy McIntosh, which was written back in, I believe it was the late 70s. Um, but she was kind of the first person to really coin this term, white privilege. And she referred to it as an invisible knapsack, like a backpack um, of special provisions, maps, passports, code books, visas, clothes, tools, and blank checks. So she was basically saying, you know, white people in the United States kind of carry around this invisible backpack that has all of these privileges in it, basically, right? Um, things that we don't have to think about or worry about. Um, we can go where we want to without, you know, being um, followed or harassed or um, without somebody thinking the worst of us. So white privilege. Um, some examples that are also you know, pointed out today. Um, this has been changing this first one a lot in the past few years, which is awesome. Um, but for for most of my life, you know, if you went to buy a flesh, quote unquote, flesh colored bandage, or if you were picking out a quote unquote flesh colored crown from a box of crayons, um, you know, that flesh color was always the color of a white person's flesh or skin. Um, now, a lot of makeup brands until very recently did not really cater to people with skin darker than, you know, quote unquote, honey shade. Um, so I even saw a couple of weeks ago, they're making um, suntan lotion now that is made for people with, you know, darker pigments in their skin so that, you know, the suntan lotion isn't like bright white um so uh there's been a lot you know rihanna's fenty beauty line um i saw on shark tank just last week another um you know brand that is promoting you know makeup that is um you know more geared and specializes in darker skin tones so this is changing that's good um, but for a long time, a very long time, you know, makeup, band-aids, crayons, um, 
kind of just assumed, right, that the flesh color was going to be the color of a white person's flesh. Uh, another example here, um, you know, things like being racially profiled by um, by law enforcement. Most definitely, we hear about that a lot recently. Um, but also, you know, just of any person on the street, you know, walking through a park. Um, you know, you're walking through a nice neighborhood or driving by um, the you know store clerk at Publix or um, you know, don't want to call it Publix, any store, right? Walmart, Winn-Dixie, um, Target, wherever, you know, managers, employees, kind of, um, you know, racially profiling and just kind of assuming based on, you know, the color of your skin, what you're wearing, how you appear that you are, you know, a, a suspect of a certain, you know, crime. And also, you know, even today, um, there, even though there's laws against it, there continues to be kind of discrimination within hiring practices. And there was a recent study, there have been a lot of studies like this, but a recent one by Cambridge University sent out um, resumes to uh, over 1,300 different, you know, job ads, classified ads for jobs. And they sent fake resumes half of them, and the resumes were like the same, same exact experience, same education. Only on half of them, they put, you know, quote unquote, black sounding names. And on the other half, they would put, you know, quote unquote, white sounding names. And they found that the resumes with quote unquote, black sounding names were 50% less likely to get a call back than the other resumes that had white sounding names. Again, same exact experience, education, everything like that. Um, if you're interested in this topic, there's a good documentary I posted in chapter 11 in the video section. Uh, it's produced by MTV, but really good interviews um, and really thoughtful uh, little documentary, I thought, about um, white privilege in the United States, and it's called White People. All right, now we're going to turn to kind of another thing here. Um, so we're going to look at this range of intergroup relations. So we're going to look at six different categories within our intergroup relations spectrum. And that just refers to, you know, how do different groups of people in certain societies like interact with one another. And so we're gonna look at this spectrum from pluralism down to genocide. Um, and we'll find that, you know, there's a range here of tolerance to intolerance. So our first category is pluralism. This is the most tolerant intergroup relationship. So pluralism, like this picture, it's like, you know, everybody can fit in together and you know, they can retain their own, um, you know, identity and what makes them special and unique. Um, but we can all kind of appreciate each other's differences without judging. So, you know, no distinction is made between, you know, who's a dominant group or a subordinate group. You know, every person has equal standing. Um, there's, you know, this multicultural environment of acceptance and there's this metaphor you may have heard of before of the u.s as like the salad bowl culture kind of this dream for us to aspire to where you know like a like a salad you know you got all your different ingredients you got your olives your onions your croutons um your lettuce your salad dressing well maybe let's leave out salad dressing um, it's not going to fit with my metaphor, but right, you have all these ingredients and you just kind of mix them all up together and it makes a delicious salad, but each of those ingredients kind of retains its form, right? It's not like a soup, um, where everything might kind of get melted into each other. So each ingredient is kind of distinct, keeps its own flavor, um, 
so in the same way, you know, pluralism refers to when, you know, different groups with different kind of cultural backgrounds, different identities can all just kind of co-mingle, mix together, um, and that that mingling, this togetherness, you know, cre create something bigger and more beautiful combined. So true pluralism, you know, true respect on the part of all these different types of groups, is very difficult to achieve. Um, you know, it requires you know a lot of um, consciousness, a lot of open-mindedness, mutual respect, um, and kind of an active, uh, an active desire to you know avoid stereotypes, avoid discrimination. Now, our next category is called assimilation. So we're moving a um, little bit less tolerant here. So assimilation refers to when a society is welcoming to other groups of people, but you know, with kind of a, a hesitancy or a, a caveat, like you can come into our society, we will accept you, but you have to change some of your lifestyles, your beliefs, your values, the way you talk, the way you dress, in order for us to fully accept you, um, you have to assimilate. You have to kind of become one of us. So this is when minority individuals or groups give up their own identity and traditions and conform to um, kind of the more dominant culture, the characteristics, lifestyles, and beliefs. So if this happens probably more often than pluralism in our country, where, you know, we, if we welcome, you know, new groups of people into our society in the U.S., um, there's usually kind of like this underlying expectation that, well, you're not, you're gonna, you know, you're going to assimilate, you're going to become a quote, an American, whatever that, you know, means to certain people. Um, you know, you're going to learn English and speak English and, you know, dress a certain way and talk a certain way um, and have certain values, right, that you know, Americans share. So this becomes, you know, especially in the U.S., kind of a key function for immigrants having, you know, needing to assimilate to this larger culture to conform to, you know, the values of, say, Americanism. So oftentimes, you know, this can lead to, you know, that the minority group, the smaller, um, less powerful groups, cultural identity being absorbed into the larger dominant culture. Our third category, oh yeah, um, is amalgamation. So this is when society accepts that a minority group and a majority group can combine to form a new group that is essentially uh, achieved through intermarriage and you know, procreation uh, between people of different races so this is um you know when society basically accepts that you can marry you can have children with you can love someone of a different race or racial category than your own. Throughout most of our history in the United States, there have been laws, um, federal and state laws, prohibiting intermarriage between white and black Americans. Um, this changed really not that long ago in the grand scheme of things. Um, the U.S. Supreme Court in 1967, in a case called Loving versus Virginia, um, struck down all bans against interracial marriage. So only a little over 50 years ago. Um, and before that, you know, there were interracial marriage could, you know, get you landed in jail or worse. There's also a really great video about this case, Loving v. Virginia, um, in Chapter 11, um, the video section.
All right, now we're moving much more toward our kind of intolerant intergroup relations here. So now we're in segregation. So this is when we've certainly seen this um, intergroup relationship in our country. Uh, this is when two groups or more are physically separated, particularly in residence, so where they live, but also in workplace and social functions. So there's two primary types of segregation. That is de jure segregation and de facto segregation. So de jure, when you see that word jure, try and think of, let me try and give you a clue here, think of, um, you know, like jury duty, right? In a courtroom, we have juries, right, that decide the guilt or innocence of someone. Um, so if you see that word de jour, think of, you know, a courtroom, and then hopefully you can take it another step and think of like the law, right? So de jour segregation is segregation enforced by official law, which, you know, I mentioned apartheid South Africa would be one example, but we also, you know, we had U.S., um, the Jim Crow laws across our country where it was legal to provide separate but equal facilities to white and black people. And this was sanctioned by you know, our legislative system. So that would be de jure segregation, segregation enforced by law. However, as I said a little bit earlier, just because you get rid of de jure segregation, you outlaw it, say, okay, no more of that, we're all equal, we're all going to have the same bathrooms and movie theaters and water fountains, etc. We're going to go to school together. Um, de facto segregation can kind of linger on beyond the de jour. So de facto segregation is enforced by custom and can't necessarily be abolished by you know, the court system or the law. Um, Again, as I mentioned earlier, you know, truly getting rid of, um, you know, this way of thinking, these kind of discriminatory, prejudicial um, ways of thinking and acting, and, you know, these assumptions or thoughts that people in different groups should be segregated, you know, doesn't just disappear overnight, right? Could take generations of a struggle and change to really get there. Um, this map right here shows us Atlanta, pretty recent census map of Atlanta. Um, but you can see how, you know, de facto segregation kind of lives on in many of our cities around the country. So the areas that are blue on this map, so you know, most of in North Atlanta here. Um, that's where the white people, the white residents live in and around Atlanta. And the areas that are in green, all, you know, South Atlanta down here, that's where all the black residents live in Atlanta. And you can see a pretty stark divide here, you know, between the blue dots and the green dots. Um, and right, we don't have de jour segregation anymore. There's no laws saying that black people and white people in this country, in Atlanta, cannot live on the same side of the um, street or on the same street, right? But uh, even so, you can see how kind of residential segregation has lingered on through de facto segregation over time with kind of this stark difference on the census map. All right, our next category is expulsion. So we're getting very close to the least tolerant intergroup relation. Um, expulsion is when a subordinate group is forced by a dominant group to leave a certain area or country on the basis of their race or ethnicity. So we've seen two forms of this, at least in the United States history. Um, we have the Trail of Tears, um, the forced relocation of Native Americans um, in our history. 
moving them away from you know the lands that their ancestors had you know grown and lived and died on um, and forcing them to move you know west of the Mississippi um, to lands unknown to them and then Japanese American um, American citizens were actually relocated uh, during World War II, after the attack on Pearl Harbor, they were relocated primarily in California to um, internment camps. And they were forced to live there until pretty much the end of the war. Um, and anyone who had at least one-eighth Japanese ancestry was expected and forced to uh, move onto these internment camps in 1942. Now, our most intolerant uh, intergroup relationship here is genocide. So a step beyond expulsion, um, not just expelling someone from a certain territory or land, but literally you know, expelling someone from their life. Um, so this is the most toxic intergroup relationship, and it involves deliberately trying to annihilate a specific group of people. Again, you know, Hitler, World War II, the, um, you know, the singling out of particularly Jewish peoples, but also as well, Catholics, people with disabilities, homosexuals, um, were all kind of singled out by the Nazi party and Hitler. Um, they were scapegoated as, you know, kind of the um, the source of all the evils that Germany was facing. And, you know, if only we could just get rid of um, all of these different people, well, then Germany can be great again. Um, so, you know, of course, that was a very famous genocide in our world history. Um, and then even more recently, we still have genocides going on today. Um, the genocide in Darfur, um, began in the Sudan in 2003. Uh, it's still going on today, actually, um, where you know certain government militias in the Sudan are kind of systematically trying to get rid of the Darfuri ethnic group there. Um, as of a couple years ago, half a million Darfuri people have been murdered. Over three million have been displaced. You know, have fled the country as refugees to neighboring countries. All right, so we got through a lot of our vocab terms. We got through um, our inter six types of intergroup relationships. And now, kind of the rest of this lecture is going to be kind of a little socio-historical look at all sorts of different ethnic or racial groups in our country. So some of this you might know, some of it maybe you haven't heard before. So we're going to take a quick look at some of these here. So number one, Native Americans. Um, obviously, they are the only non-immigrant ethnic group in our country. They were here when the colonists arrived. You know, they were here before any of our ancestors were. Um, Native American population today makes up less than 1% of our overall um, U.S. population. And sometimes they're still referred to today um, as a misnomer of Indians, um, although Christopher Columbus, you know, mistakenly labeled them Indians because, whoopsies, he thought he landed in India. Um, but no, he was in the New World. So, we sometimes people still call Native Americans Indians today. Um, but even that term Native American, right, still glosses over the fact that there were over 500 different tribes, um, you know, at the time that the colonists landed on this land. So for hundreds of years, um, don't really have time to get into all the details here. But members of Native American tribes were forcibly removed from their lands, the Trail of Tears, they were moved onto reservations, um, there were bounties paid in exchange for their scalps, they were bought and sold as slaves and indentured servants, 
treaties were made, treaties were broken, and they were faced you know, also with discrimination, violence, rape, and murder. Now, there's kind of three main impactful laws for us to consider very quickly concerning Native American history. Um, but first we've got, you know, the Indian Removal Act of 1830. And this is what, um, what started, you know, the Trail of Tears, kind of this institutional um, expulsion of uh, Native Americans. And notice they call it the Indian Removal Act. Um, so this is the forced relocation of all Native tribes who were living east of the Mississippi, and they were moved to west of the Mississippi River. Then in 1851 and 1871, we have the Indian Appropriation Acts, um, which funded further removals of Native Americans from their lands. And it also said that no Indian or Native American tribe could be recognized as an independent nation anymore. And so the US didn't have to make treaties with them any longer. And then in 1887, we have, um, a reversal of the policy of isolating Native Americans on reservations. And now instead they changed the plan to um, forcing Native Americans onto properties with white settlers in order to reduce their social power and solidarity as a group. Then the following decade in the 1890s is when we saw the beginning of like Indian boarding schools. Over 30,000 Native American children were removed from their households and their parents and their families, and they were placed in the, these Indian boarding schools um, that, that were run by the U.S. government and also, um, you know, missionaries. And there were laws that passed um, across the country that said Native American children pretty much would only be taught and educated by white people from then on. So they were removed from their culture. You know, you can see, um, you know, if you look at these two pictures, kind of on the middle and the right, this is the same group of students when they first arrived to the Indian boarding school on the left and, you know, after they'd been here there for a while on the right. And you can see, you know, they were, um, they look pretty different. They were dressed, you know, quote unquote, civilized now. Um, they were forced to cut their hair. They were forced to learn and only speak English and practice Christianity and not their tribal religions. And the goal was to, quote unquote, you know, to civilize the savages or, you know, there was a popular motto back in the day called kill the Indian, save the man. Then in the 1960s, Native Americans actually, um, you know, got pretty involved in the civil rights movement. And, you know, in addition to the Civil Rights Act, um, for Black Americans, we also had something called the Indian Civil Rights Act of 1968, which guaranteed the Bill of Rights to all Native Americans. So now all Native Americans were considered full U.S. citizens with all of the rights that that includes. Um, in 1975, we had the Indian Self-Determination Act, which gave tribes more power over their land and sovereignty and asserted that the U.S. government must honor treaties made with tribes. And then, um, unfortunately, despite the progress that's been made, right, especially since the 60s, um, and I mentioned this in other chapters as well, chapter nine in particular, you know, Native Americans still kind of face um, the worst high school graduation rates, the worst poverty rates, um, you know, very inadequate social services, uh, lower standards of living, you know, cultural dislocation, lower life expectancy, um, and very high rates of unemployment even still. And something that's a little bit more current today in the past like 10 years or so 
there had been a lot of controversy about all these different pipelines that have been um, you know, built across the country, um, which, you know, the pipelines are being built, you know, to increase, you know, our energy independence in the United States. However, a lot of those pipelines, like the Dakota Access Pipeline or the Keystone XL, um, you know, they, they cut through a lot of tribal lands and across um, a lot of, like, sacred um, mountains and um, important water sources for Native American tribes. And so a lot of those pipelines have kind of been stalled and then restarted and stalled and restarted due to a lot of protesting um, <clears throat> on the part of you know, Native peoples against kind of the encroachment um, of these pipelines across you know, their lands. Now, African Americans, um, the ancestors of, you know, of African Americans obviously did not come to the U.S. by choice. Um, in 1619 is when the first Africans were transported to Virginia, when it was still a colony, and they were sold as indentured servants. By 1705, a little less than 100 years later, Virginia passed the slave codes stating that any foreign born non Christian could be bought and sold as a slave. The next hundred years, we obviously saw a rapid growth and rise of slavery across the country, particularly the South. Uh, millions of Africans were kidnapped from their homes and transported across the Atlantic Ocean. And many died during that journey. Um, by 1869, the slave trade was even internal to the U.S., so now it wasn't so much about um, shipping slaves overseas, the trade was between different states now. And slaves obviously were denied the most basic human rights and freedoms that we're all entitled to, um, and they were repeatedly you know, subject to whippings, execution, rapes, denial of any kind of, you know, adequate health care education. Obviously, slavery was a critical issue leading up to the Civil War, and it really divided our nation um, ideologically and geographically. So President Lincoln, you know, issued the Emancipation Proclamation, 1862. Um, by June 19th, 1965, which now is a national holiday called Juneteenth, slavery had effectively ended in the U.S. So that's when, um, I should say 1865, by the way. All right. Um, so, you know, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation in 1962, but it took a while for that word of the slaves being free now to get to every um, nook and cranny of the country. And so I believe it was Galveston, Texas, was the last holdout um, city that was continuing to practice slavery until Union soldiers eventually showed up in Galveston in 1965, three years later, um, to you know, inform all of the people who were still enslaved there that they had been free now for several years. So following the Civil War, we have three really important amendments added to our Constitution. Um, we have the 13th Amendment, ended slavery and involuntary servitude in the U.S. The 14th Amendment granted citizenship to all free slaves and the 15th guaranteed the right to vote for all citizens without regard for their race, color, or condition of servitude. Now, of course, right, just because laws are passed doesn't mean everyone wakes up the next day and says, okay, everything has changed. The whole way that I think and view the world is completely different, right? Um, we all know things take time. Um, and not everyone is willing to change the way they think or believe or act um, ever or, you know, at least instantaneously. 
So despite the passage of these amendments, the freeing of the slaves, the granting of citizenship, the granting of the right to vote, discrimination against Black Americans continued onward, particularly in the form of institutional discrimination like the Jim Crow laws. And that's doctrine of being separate but equal, which was enforced by our Supreme Court um, early on. <clears throat> saying, you know, it was okay to segregate people so long as you provided, you know, fairly equal um, resources for each group. So, you know, you could segregate water fountains as and make certain people you know, drink from one and certain people drink from the other, as long as you were providing, you know, water for both of these groups of people. However, this was ended in 1954 when a new Supreme Court ruled in Brown versus Board of Education that this doctrine of separate but equal had, you know, been around long enough and it was time to move on with a full sense of equality for all in our country. Obviously, you know, where we are today is due to the efforts of thousands, tens of thousands, probably more people who we won't ever even know their names um, throughout our history, and people who have fought against, um, you know, both uh, de facto and de jure, you know, discrimination and prejudice in our country against Black Americans. Um, so the Civil Rights Act of 1964 was, you know, just a result of, you know, many unnamed and named activists, people who devoted their entire lives, put their lives on the line to fight for freedom and equality. So by 1964, we had the Civil Rights Act, which banned discrimination based on race, color, religion, sex, or national origin. However, even still today, um, you know, a lot of studies and analyses show that there's still kind of these um, these repercussions, you know, the these lineages of having been discriminated against for so long. Like we talked about in chapter nine, right? Like wealth takes time to build. It passed down through generations. And if entire groups of people are kind of barred, are kept from building wealth over generations for a long time, um, you know, the thought is that you know, other people have kind of had a, a head start in that race, so to speak. So today, um, Black Americans or African Americans, whatever term you prefer, um, you know, currently accounts for about 13 to 14 percent of the U.S. population. And even though, you know, kind of official discrimination against African Americans has been outlawed, you know, there's still not quite complete equality. So there's this organization called um, the Equality Index, and they, you know, every few years, they, you know, measure out kind of Blacks overall equality level when compared with whites in America. And they look at five different variables or categories to assess the equality index. They look at economic health, they look at you know, health um, and well-being, they look at education, social justice, and civic engagement. So they look at those five categories and then determine, <clears throat> you know, how much social power, um, you know, Black Americans have in comparison to white Americans across these five categories. So you can see in um, 2016, uh, it says 72.2%. You can look over here. So that's essentially saying that, you know, if white people have 100% of the pie, let's say this is a pie, um, that when you look at like these five categories of economics, health, education, social justice, civic and 
engagement that black Americans still only have about 72.2% of the pie. So that was in 2016. Things got a little better by 2020. Now it's um, closer to you know 74% of the pie. <clears throat> but still, you know, missing about 26% of you know kind of full equality um, with white Americans based on these five categories. And I have a link down here if you want to read more or look more into um, the National Urban League Equality Index. Obviously, you know, the Black Lives Matter movement um, has made it very clear that, you know, we still have a long way to go. I mentioned in the deviance chapter um, that black men in particular still have the highest rate of incarceration of any <clears throat> gender or, or racial um, combination. So today, you know, this well-known statistic is that one in three black men born today um, can expect to find themselves incarcerated at some point during their life. Compare that to, you know, one in 17 white men or even one in six, you know, Hispanic men. So it's a, a pretty stark you know, disparity even still. And at the same time, you know, there have been studies that show that um, particularly with drug um, offenses <clears throat> that white Americans actually report higher rates of drug use repeatedly across so many different kinds of drugs, um, with the exception of crack, which we also talked about in chapter nine. Um, however, black Americans go to prison for drug offenses at, you know, pr fairly higher rates than white Americans do. Uh, other studies have shown, you know, black drivers are more likely to have their vehicle searched and twice as likely to be arrested during a traffic stop. And, I mean, countless names have come to us throughout um, you know, kind of the what, almost 10 year history of the Black Lives Matter movement um, so far. Uh, and while some progress has been made, you know, Derek Chauvin was convicted and sent to prison. Um, and then, you know, we recently had the case in Brunswick, Georgia of Ahmaud Arbery and his you know, killers being convicted, um, not only of, you know, killing him, but also of, you know, a federal hate crime. Um, and they will be spending, you know, the rest of their lives in uh, prison. So there has been progress. However, you know, these cases still seem to be popping up um, all too often, right? And they're, I used to try to memorize all the names and there's just so many cases and so many names at a certain point that it's just overwhelming. And that, that fact in itself is, um, you know, it should be a concern to to all of us in this society that um, you know promotes equality, right, of all people. So hopefully, you know, I think this movement has has done a lot, um, and I think the recent convictions, you know, of Chauvin and um, the McMichaels, um, and the men who killed Ahmaud Arbery, you know, are are evidence that things are changing. Um, not fast enough, maybe for some of us, but they are changing. All right, now we'll turn um, to Asian Americans. So this term, you know, Asian Americans, um, kind of covers this huge swath of different types of people from different countries and different cultures and ethnicities. So, you know, this is a pretty broad umbrella term. Um, this very diverse group composes about 5 to 6% of the U.S. population today. Um, however, that might seem small, but just in the year 2000, Asian Americans only made up 
0.004% of the population. So going from that to 5 to 6% is actually a pretty big jump in about 22 years. So Asian Americans, all sorts of different types of people from different countries, you know, have kind of come to the U.S. in different waves at different times and for different reasons. Um, and, you know, the kind of history of Asian American immigration uh, is very varied, you know, depending on you know, the context and who, what particular subgroup um, within this label, you know, who's coming. So kind of the earliest group of Asian immigrants coming to the U.S was from China during the 1850s. And these immigrants were mostly men who were moving to the US by themselves, not with their families. They would just come alone um, and they would move to the, the West Coast, you know, California, um, particularly worked in, you know, mining and agriculture and did a lot to help build our transcontinental railroad. Um, and they would come over in order to, you know, make some good money, and then they would send that money back to their families in China. And that, you know, lasted a good 30 years or so until, you know, uh, white Americans started, you know, raising a stink and saying, um, you know, like this picture down here on the right, um, kind of arguing that, Chinese men, you know, these immigrants who were coming over were stealing their jobs. And so that led to the 1882 Chinese Exclusion Act, which put a stop to immigration from China um, because, you know, again, they were this kind of a group being scapegoated for um, the unemployment of white Americans at the time. And it wasn't until 1965 so what, almost 80 years later um, that we passed the Immigration and Nationality Act, which then loosened these restrictions on immigration from China. Another large Asian um, group who immigrated to the U.S. are Japanese immigrants who started coming over around the 1880s. Uh, many would immigrate to Hawaii to work in the sugar trade, and many others moved to California. Um, unlike the Chinese immigrants who were coming over just like men by themselves, sending money back to their families, Japanese immigrants came with their wives and their children. So they kind of came to stay. They came to establish themselves in this country. And so they were, you know, unlike Chinese immigrants, they, you know, quickly produced, you know, second, third generation Japanese Americans. However, um, as often happens, you know, there was, again, kind of a, a form of scapegoating against Japanese immigrants. Um, by 1913, we had the passage of the California Alien Land Law. And this prohibited Japanese immigrants from owning land in the United States. So Japanese immigrants were coming over and they were actually really successful. They were owning their own businesses and um, really thriving on the West Coast and in Hawaii. And again, you know, kind of they got scapegoated eventually. Um, you know, a lot of white Americans didn't like to see, you know, another racial ethnic group kind of surpassing them um, in terms of economic and social power. And so this led to the California alien land law. And things got even you know, more tumultuous for Japanese Americans after in the midst of World War II, um, the bombing of Pearl Harbor, when I mentioned earlier, you know, the US government forced 127,000 Japanese Americans into internment camps from 1942 to 1946. Um, so interestingly, you know, you hear a lot about um, um, like reparations for African Americans, right? And why that hasn't happened and discussions about that. 
but all of the survivors of the internment camps, uh, all the Japanese American survivors in 1988 were given $20,000 as reparations for their internment. Another group of Asian Americans, or two other groups um, that are fairly prominent, are Vietnamese Americans and Korean Americans. Um, so they started coming during kind of the, the later half of the 1900s. Um, so Korean immigrants kind of start coming over gradually over time, um, whereas Vietnamese immigration happened pretty quickly once um, communism kind of overtook Vietnam. Um, and the U.S. kind of welcomed them in as political refugees en masse. Today, you know, Vietnamese and Korean Americans each make up less than 1% of the overall population. And Asian Americans, and I mentioned this in other lectures, you know, tend to be, um, you know, economically very well off as a whole. Um, they tend to have degrees of um, a high number of you know degrees and college education they um, tend to uh, have incomes and wealth uh, at the same level or even surpassing a lot of white americans um, and so they're often called you know kind of the model minority um, that you know they are they're kind of this minority group that is seen as, you know, kind of exceeding, as reaching, you know, educational, professional, socioeconomic levels without challenging kind of the existing order, the existing power structure. Um, however, uh, so that's kind of, you know, a positive stereotype maybe. Um, however, things kind of changed a little bit when COVID hit. Um, because COVID, you know, was kind of blamed um, on, you know, the Chinese and the bio labs in China were the, you know, the bats that were being sold at a market. Um, and so since China was kind of blamed as the, um, the source, right, of, of where COVID-19 um, originated, um, it kind of mm, resulted in a lot of anti-Asian sentiment across the country. Um, and actually, in 16 of America's largest cities, the rates of anti-Asian hate crimes increased by almost 150% between March and December of 2020. And look at, you can see New York City up here, um, a huge jump in hate crimes. Um, anti-Asian hate crimes. All right, a few more here. Now we got Hispanic Americans or Latino Americans, um, two kind of interchangeable terms that we use. Or today there's, you know, Latinx. Um, but also whatever term we use, this refers to a very wide range of countries and backgrounds and nationalities. Um, this diverse group of immigrants makes up about 19 to 20% of our US population. Um, the vast majority of quote unquote Hispanic Americans come from Mexico, Cuba, or Puerto Rico, among many, many other countries. Um, but on the next few slides, we're mostly going to focus on you know, Mexican Americans and Cuban Americans. So Mexican Americans are kind of the largest Hispanic subgroup and they've been around in our country the longest. Uh, Mexican migration started in the early 1900s as a result of the US need for cheap agricultural labor. So um, their migration to the US was often what we call circular meaning, you know, Mexican migrants would come into the U.S., they would stay, they would work a few years, and then they'd go back to Mexico with their families and um, enjoy their time with their families, bring back some money to them, and then, you know, they'd come back to the U.S., and then kind of a circular pattern of, you know, going back and um, 
coming back in. And actually, you know, during the 1940s and 50s, the U.S. government was very, very inviting to Mexican migrants and Mexican labor. Um, we even had a federal program called the Bracero Program. Bracero, if you don't know Spanish, means uh, strong arm. And this program offered protection to Mexican guest workers. It was like, you know, please come, come into the U.S., help us. We'll take care of you. We'll make sure, you know, we we take care of um, anything you need. However, as we are already seeing a pattern here, um, you know, a lot of white Americans were not so happy with the influx of uh, Mexican labor coming in, you know, stealing their jobs, um, quote unquote. So in 1954, we have Operation Wetback enacted by the government um, and this policy then, you know, kind of reversed the Bracero program and deported thousands of illegal Mexican workers. And kind of this kind of sentiment, um, even though the Mexican American population has been, you know, kind of growing and growing and growing over all this time, um, you know, this kind of anti uh, Mexican sentiment still kind of lingers very strongly. Um, in the country, you know, which is very sad. Um, you know, if you've ever, uh, <clears throat> you know, been down to a border town or, um, you know, talk to any Mexican immigrant, you know, that they, you know, love this country and work so hard um, to, <clears throat> you know, to give back and to pay their taxes and to do everything that they can. Um, so, uh, unfortunately, you know, in 1986, we have the Immigration Reform and Control Act, which really kicked off a new era of kind of anti-Mexican sentiment. Um, and this is where kind of our militarized border enforcement really kicked off, um, which obviously we, you know, are still seeing today. You know, President Trump had a big, you know, component of his first presidential campaign was, you know, to build the wall like a big strong wall between Mexico and Canada and kind of this um, uh, perhaps you might say scapegoating um, of you know, Mexican people. Now another large Hispanic American subgroup um, after you know Mexican Americans are Cuban Americans. Um, and their migration to the U.S. started after Fidel Castro came to power in 1959 and implemented communism um, across the country of Cuba and kind of reached a peak with what's called the Mariel Boatlift in 1980. And that was a time when Castro pretty much said, if anyone wants to leave Cuba, if they are not you know, on the side of the communists, they can leave right now. And all these people got on these boats and headed out from Cuba to the United States and the United States opened them uh, or opened up um, to them and allowed them to come in as refugees. So many you know, of the wealthier and more educated Cubans fled Castro's um, communist government and they were given refugee status, offered protection and social services. Then, in 1995, um, things changed a little bit, we weren't as welcoming anymore. Um, so then we had the Cuban Migration Agreement, which aimed to restrict immigration from Cuba. And this then led to a larger influx of Cubans trying to get here illegally, because now we had kind of made it a lot harder to come legally. Um, so this is when the U.S. implemented something called the wet foot, dry foot policy. Sorry, I just that all out. Um, which meant, you know, if Cuban, it's kind of a weird law, y'all. Um, it meant, you know, if illegal Cuban migrants, if they were coming over in, you know, kind of these little boats like this, um, if they made it onto the shore of Florida, if they had a dry foot, you know, they got their foot on the land of the United States, 
the NAIC would be allowed to stay in the United States. But if the Coast Guard apprehended their boat or them before they got their foot on dry land, so they had a wet foot, so to speak, then they could be deported back to Cuba. Um, so the wet foot, dry foot policy was enacted in the 90s. And in 2014, um, you know, President Obama announced kind of more normalized relations with Cuba. They eased sanctions. They allowed for more trade, more investment, even for travel to and from Cuba. Um, however, in 2017, a lot of that was reversed. Um, in the Trump administration, he reinstated a lot of the restrictions on travel and trade and investment. Um, however, you know, he kept the lifted sanctions. Now, Hispanic Americans, when it comes to assimilation, um, you know, tend to have different rates. Um, you can see a number of different um, immigrant groups on this graph, actually. Um, but, you know, it's often studies show that um, Cuban Americans have tended to be a little bit better assimilated into kind of U.S. culture um, than Mexican Americans. And who knows, maybe that has to do with, you know, kind of the fact that a lot of the Cubans who have come to the U.S. are coming because of um, kind of their refugee status as anti-communists. All right, a couple more groups. We got Arab Americans here. Um, also refers to an incredibly diverse group. Um, you, know, you can come from Iran or Turkey or Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Oman, Pakistan, you know, Afghanistan, Syria, Sudan, Jordan, um, Libya, and be considered an Arab American. So very diverse culture um, and background and history from each of these you know, different countries. Um, Arabia does not exist anymore, um, but the Arab region that it refers to covers, you know, most of the Middle East and stretches across North Africa as well. Importantly, important to note, not all Arabs are Muslim and not all Muslims are Arab. So Arab Americans today make up about 1% of the U.S. population. More than half of that population is composed of immigrants from Syria, Lebanon, and Jordan. And many of them are actually Christians that came here to escape persecution. Many Arab Americans are very highly educated and they came here looking for escape from political, civil war, turmoil, and other forms of <clears throat> um, you know, unrest or persecution. Today, most Af or Arab Americans are immigrating from Iraq, Egypt, and Somalia. And many, there's like big communities of Arab Americans um, you know, across California and New York, and particularly in Michigan. Now, Arab-Israeli relations during the 1970s took a turn for the worst. Um, there was a big conflict over <clears throat> um, or between kind of these two different nations, Palestine and Israel. And, <clears throat> you know, Palestinians were, um, you know, in an Islamic state, Israel is a Jewish state. However, both of these, um, you know, nations argued that they both had claim to the same land, the same plot of land. And so over time, between 1947 um, and the present day, there was a lot of conflict and you may call it a civil war um, you know, between Palestinians and um, Israelis over this land. And during the 70s, the U.S. was kind of um, compelled to take a side. And they ended up taking the side of Israel in this land struggle. And so that kind of started out a lot of the anti-Arab sentiment um, in the United States. 
because the U.S. was kind of, you know, the supporter of Israel and their claim for the land. And that put them up at odds with the positions of many you know, Middle Eastern countries who believed that Palestine um, should have, you know, full rights to that land. And a lot of uh, Middle Eastern countries, you know, denied the fact that Israel was a legitimate state. And that only, you know, further compounded with, you know, 9-11 um, and the aftermath. Of course, you know, the terrorist attacks um, <clears throat> were committed and, um, you know, Arab Americans across the country, you know, faced pretty extreme prejudice, discrimination, hate crimes, um, even still today as a result of that terrorist attack in 2001. And lastly, you know, I kind of started out this chapter, we talked about the social construction of race, right? Um, and today, you know, we talk about white people. Um, but when we talk about that category of white people, um, you know, there's peoples within that category whose family, whose families come from all sorts of different countries and backgrounds and cultures over you know, many, many years. So, um, you know, kind of white people come from a very diverse backgrounds historically as well. Um, the original settlers in the U.S. were obviously, you know, white Protestants from England. So those were kind of your original white people um, in this social construction of the white race. Then in 1820s, we started seeing an influx of European immigrants from Germany and Ireland. And you can see on this picture here, kind of an old propaganda picture. Um, it's got a little blurry, but they've got, you know, a ballot box here. And this says Irish whiskey. And this one says lager beer, which is referring to, you know, German. So this is, you know, an Irishman and a German immigrant kind of taking away the ballot box from, <coughs> I guess I assume, white Protestants from England. So there was a lot of you know, hatred, discrimination against um, Irish and German immigrants when they first got over to the United States. Um, Germans were a little bit less discriminated against, um, but Irish were not really as financially well off and um, a lot of them came to the U.S. as a result of the potato famine of uh, 1845. In the 1890s, there was another wave of European immigration coming to the U.S., this time from Italy, Poland, Bulgaria, and Austria-Hungary, along with Jewish refugees escaping um, in the pogroms in Russia and Eastern Europe. And they also, when they first arrived, particularly Italians, um, you know, were certainly not viewed as, you know, quote, unquote, white when they first got to the country. So German immigrants were not quite welcome with open arms, but they weren't victimized as much as some of these other groups. They established roots, particularly across the Midwest. There's still big German festivals. You know, we've got Helen, Georgia. Um, there's cities across the country that still, you know, celebrate, um, you know, kind of their German lineage and pride. Of course, a big notable exception to that would be during World War II and III when the United States, you know, fought um, Germany. And so there was, you know, quite a bit of anti-German sentiment during those um, time periods in our country. Now, Irish immigrants um, were considered an underclass, a race apart from white people when they first arrived. Um, you know, kind of a different status from the English or the German immigrants. And the English had oppressed the Irish for centuries. So this goes back to, you know, history that we aren't even going to get into here. Um, but the English had been trying to get rid of the Irish language, their customs, their identity, had discriminated against um, Catholicism for years. 
Um, and during the mid 19, uh, sorry, 1600s, half a million Irish were killed by the English. Um, and over 300,000 were transported to the US as slaves. Um, and they were often, and still kind of are, um, stereotyped as you know, dirty drunkards, as lacking ambition, as only worthy of like hard labor and menial jobs, <clears throat> as unintelligent. And when they arrived in the country, because of all of this, you know, discrimination, they formed very tight knit, you know, very inward looking groups, very segregated communities all along the East Coast. Of course, today, you know, it took a couple centuries, but today Irish Americans are considered, you know, quote unquote, white people. Um, they've been, you know, assimilated into that identity although they certainly were not welcomed with open arms when they first arrived. And our last slide here, Italian immigrants started reaching the shores of the US um, in the early, late 1800s, early 1900s. Um, <clears throat> but you know, Italian immigrants as well were kind of viewed as unpure, as you know, not quite white, um, not fully, you know, worthy of being an American. And so a lot of Italian immigrants lived in segregated slums, particularly across the Northeast, um, in Jersey and, uh, you know, New York, and many became victims of violence and lynchings. Um, <clears throat> a lot of, you know, jobs posted like this one right here from 1888 you know, would say, you know, we're not going to employ any Italians. Um, they were known for doing kind of the jobs no one else wanted to do, the dirty, the dangerous jobs for very little pay. And that's also why, you know, you have the creation of the mafia eventually, because, you know, Italians were being kind of shut out of a lot of the legitimate opportunities in the country. And so they kind of created an opportunity for themselves via the mafia. Um, but over time, you know, Italian Americans have become assimilated into this category of whiteness, this social, socially constructed race of what is white, um, even though they most definitely were not considered, you know, quote unquote white when they first arrived in the country. But today, you know, little Italy neighborhoods are all across the country, um, all over the Northeast, New York. Um, and they're pretty, you know, strong, culturally, um, culturally strong, uh, you know, group in, uh, in our country. All right. So that brings us to the end of this week on race and ethnicity. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so make sure you check your course schedule, um, and the announcements page, make sure you know when the chapter 11 quiz will be due. And please reach out to me um, if you have any questions or concerns. We're not quite at the end of the semester yet, but we're getting close to it. So, you know, hang in there. Um, and we have what, about 12, 13, 14, about four chapters left to go in the semester. Um, so good job. Keep it up. Keep training those quizzes. We've got a little while until the, the next exam and written assignment. Um, all right. And I hope to hear from y'all if you have any questions or ideas or concerns about anything. Hope y'all have a great week and I look forward to hearing from you.